Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to present today. So we're going to be talking about vagal nerve stimulation um, and its potential to deliver a significant reduction in the symptoms and signs of rheumatoid arthritis. So here are my disclosures. Um, these are companies associated with uh, neurovagal stimulation or the approach to manipulation of the immune system through um, uh, the immune reflex. Pictures are allowed today. I want to speak for a second trying to create a background for the immunoinflammatory reflex, specifically looking to see how we can activate um, and modulate inflammatory pathways you can recognize that there's an efferent arm of the uh, neurostimulating system, particularly making use of the vagus nerve. You can see that there are, in fact, cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathways that mediate the production of inflammatory mediators throughout the body. Specifically, through the vagus nerve, we can see changes that will take, pl take place in the celiac plexus. We see that, in fact, there's an adrenergic splenic neuron we can see these cholinergic effects affect a variety of immune phenotypic cells that exist in this plane and influence the secretion of inflammatory cytokines such as TNF, interleukin-6, and interleukin-1. By stimulating the vagus nerve, we believe that we can downregulate the increased expression of these inflammatory cytokines, and thus downregulating the immune system. Now, thinking about the inflammatory reflex, we recognize that there are currently therapeutic methods to treat diseases. Instead of using biologics or drugs, we're talking about using electrical pulses to downregulate this process. And unlike traditional immunosuppressive biologics that may be specifically targeted one inflammatory process, by suppressing the inflammatory reflex, we believe we can suppress a variety of inflammatory cytokines in a region between 30 and 70%. We recognize that in order to trigger this electrical vagal nerve stimulation and shut down or modulate this process, we need to stimulate the vagus nerve for roughly 60 seconds. And data thus far has suggested that we can significantly reduce systemic tumor necrosis factor alpha release. And this TNF um, reduction can be sustained from between 24 and 48 hours status post the stimulation. <coughs> Now, this is original data that was presented previously and published in PNAS. This was a small 17-patient open-label study that made use of a Cyberonics pulse generator traditionally used for the treatment of epilepsy. This device was implanted in the chest wall. Leads were run to the vagus nerve. And you can see in this open-label study, there was a significant reduction in disease activity in individuals that had either failed methotrexate, being the first seven patients, or in the second cohort, those who had been inadequate responders to biologic agents. You can see that through week six, there was a reduction in the mean change in what's called the disease activity score, 28 CRP, or the DAS score. When the device was turned off, the disease returned. And when the device was turned back on at week eight, again, a subsequent reduction. Again, this was a previous study using an older device. What we're seeing now is that there's been an investigational platform developed where the traditional pulse generator with leads on the right is now being replaced by a miniaturized integrated microregulator, which you see on the left. It's approximately one inch long, or maybe just over two centimeters. It is approximately two cc's in volume. It has an inductively charged battery and it's expected to last over 10 years after implantation. It is, in fact, MRI compatible, and the pulse parameters are encoded um, so that they can specifically target the inflammatory reflex, um, and they are delivered um, through the microregulator. Now, this microregulator pulse generator is implanted. It's implanted along the vagus nerve. You can see that epitomized on the right side of the screen. This microregulator has a wireless inductive charging capacity, which is delivered through the charger, which an individual will place around the neck once a week. This charger enables the transfer of energy to the microregulator. And through an application available on the iPad, the healthcare provider can, in fact, prescribe um, and modulate how much signal is taking place through the implanted microregulator. Now, this trial 
specifically was a pilot trial designed to assess the microregulator from a safety standpoint, but also to understand whether or not there'd be clinical efficacy and applicability. We took individuals that had adult onset rheumatoid arthritis between ages 22 and 75. They had to have moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis and that they had to have more than four tender and swollen joints out of the 28 joint count and to have a C-dye greater than 10. You'll note that an elevated acute phase protein such as a C-reactive protein was not required for this population, specifically because we were looking at a very refractory patient population. Specifically, these individuals had to have had an insufficient evidence, evidence of efficacy on at least two biologic mechanisms of action, had to have failed at least two biologic or targeted synthetic DMARDs. If the individuals were still taking a biologic or a targeted synthetic, they had to be washed out from that therapy before entering the study. All patients were on background conventional synthetic DMARDs. These patients were also evaluated radiographically or radiologically through the use of an MRI and through the Ramris Carlos synovitis scoring system. And they had to have positive evidence of synovitis based on MRI at baseline. You can see the schematic of what took place in the study here. The initial lead-in group was approximately three individuals in cohort one. They all had the device implanted. They underwent active vagal nerve stimulation for approximately one minute on a daily basis. You can see that baseline assessments were done at minus six. The device was implanted at minus three. Then starting again at baseline three weeks after the device was implanted, the dose of this therapy was escalated so that it reached a maximum um, uh, amplitude and tolerability by week four. Then we followed these patients through week 12. The second cohort that was in this trial was 11 patients. These patients were randomized to either receive active vagal nerve stimulation for one minute, um, that would take place four times per day, active vagal nerve stimulation for one minute once a day, or they received sham vagal nerve stimulation. But every patient had the microregulator implanted along the vagus nerve, and all patients went through the same procedures of charging um, and titration of their therapy over time, and patients did not know whether or not they had been randomized to either sham or active therapy. You can see the demographics of the patients involved in this trial. They're relatively consistent between each of the groups. And I might draw your attention to the number of patients um, that had had prior biologic or targeted synthetics. In the daily group, this group had failed on average between four and five prior biologics or targeted therapies. The same could be said for the QID group and even in the sham group. So this was a, a significantly refractory group of patients with active rheumatoid arthritis. I'll concentrate here on the fact that first and foremost in this study, we were looking at the safety profile, specifically looking to see whether the agent um, employed here being the device would be safe for implantation and utilization. There were no device or treatment related serious adverse events. However, there were in fact one surgery associated adver serious adverse event, and that was the transient development of a left vocal cord paralysis. There were other surgery related adverse events as well, including the development of a Horner syndrome, tenderness at the surgical site, acute post-operative pain, rash, and pruritus. I'll show you here all the adverse events as they're related to each of the subjects, whether they were serious or not, the onset, causality, and anticipated or unanticipated status, and you can see virtually all have resolved, including the time frame between when the onset was and their date of resolution. Now we can shift briefly to the efficacy profile that we've seen um, with this microregulator. Over time, we followed the patient's change in the disease activity score 28 CRP or DAS 28 CRP. I'll call your attention to the different arms. First and foremost, in purple, you can see the sham. These individuals did not have any noticeable change in their disease activity over a period of 12 weeks. The second group I'll draw your attention to would be that in blue. These are the first three individuals um, who received um, implantation. And you can see a nice improvement in the DAS 28 CRP as early as week four and continuing through week 12, achieving a minimally clinically important difference in the DAS 28. 
The third of the groups I'll draw your attention to would be that of in red. This was the randomized group to receive Q-Day stimulation in stage two. You can see they roughly achieved the same degree of improvement in their DAS by week eight and through week 12, achieving a minimally clinically important difference in their DAS 28. The last of the groups would be that in green. These are the individuals who are receiving stimulation four times per day. It was interesting that in this group, we did not see any meaningful changes in disease activity score. I want to shift to those individuals that had significant change when we take a look at the total groups um, uh, expressed in a slightly different way. We can see four out of the six who received daily stimulation achieving a minimally clinically significant change, of which two patients achieved a DAS-28 remission. Those in the middle are the four time a day stimulation. You see one patient achieved a minimally clinically important difference. The other three did not. And lastly, in pink or lavender, you see those individuals that were in sham who had no meaningful changes. I alluded to early on that patients had to have evidence of synovitis based on MRI score. These patients were followed with an MRI at week 12. We can see here the various components of the RAMRA scoring system. There's change in synovitis in the upper left quadrant. and We did not see meaningful change in synovitis. You can see in the upper right quadrant, osteitis, or progenitors to erosion. In this case, we did not see any meaningful differences in osteitis. Erosions are epitomized in the left lower corner, and we did see a significant improvement in erosion scores in the daily stimulated group. We did not see any noticeable differences in erosions in sham um, or in the QID group. And lastly, the change in Carlos is change in cartilage loss. We did not see any measurable change in cartilage loss in this small group. Looking at this another way, we can look at change in erosions based on whether or not an individual was a responder or a non-responder nerve stimulation to this microregulator. You can see that those that were responders were also likely to have negative changes in the erosions, um, while those that were non-responders or sham patients had no meaningful changes in erosion. We also built into this study an opportunity to assess whether or not there was in fact a change in cytokine measurements taking place. You can see five different cytokines epitomized here, assessed through a validated cytokine analysis, specifically looking at stimulated cytokine release. And you can see in the Q-Day and Q-ID, we have meaningful changes in cytokine release, while those in the sham group did not have meaningful changes in cytokine release assays. So overall, in summary, we've been able to demonstrate that you can successfully implant a microregulator device designed to stimulate the vagus nerve. And this was done in 14 patients that had multibiologic refractory disease. We were able to do this relatively safely. There were two device-associated um, uh, surgical implantation results, um, as I mentioned. The device otherwise um, was not associated with any adverse events. We, knows, we noticed that there was, in fact, a clinical response that could be seen in this small study. Um, five out of 10 patients in the daily treatment group met or exceeded, exceeded the clinically, minimally clinically important difference based on the DAS-28 CRP, and two were able to achieve the same definition of remission based on the DAS. We're also able to identify that there was, in fact, a reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokines that corresponded with vagus nerve stimulation. And lastly, there was a trend towards joint structure preservation based on erosions in those patients that were responders, although we also saw no meaningful changes in synovitis or osteitis scores. Thus, those results were inconclusive. I wanted to thank all of the collaborators and investigators that took part. The study was sponsored by Setpoint, um, and I certainly want to thank all the patients who participated in the trial. So thank you very much.